It is great to be here with all of you. I want to start by introducing you to a Flint kid. Her name is Jasmine. And it wasn't too long ago that she came to clinic for her four-year checkup. And she's one of those kids, when you ask her how old she is, she shouts her age. So I was like, Jasmine, how old are you today? She's like, I'm four. <laughs> Another pediatrician favorite question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the answers are usually superhero, princess, basketball player, sometimes doctor, sometimes college administrator. It's for real. <laughs> I've gotten it. It's happened. It's true. I've gotten it. So when I asked Jasmine what she wanted to be when she grew up, she said, I want to be five. <laughs> it's like she knew that every year is an achievement. And in Flint, with so many of our problems, every year really is an achievement. Even before our water crisis, Flint has been in crisis for decades. Disinvestment, unemployment, poverty, racism, violence, population loss, crumbling schools, you name it, every disparity you can think of. And that makes Flint a place like so many in our country, where the zip code you are born into, even more than your genetic code, is the greatest predictor of where you'll end up. So for kids in Flint, you actually live 15 years less than kids in a neighboring adjacent zip code. 15 years. So Jasmine was right. Every year really is an accomplishment. So her physical exam was fine, and then her mom turned to me with a look that I see in the eyes of all parents who are worried about their kids. And she asked me, is she going to be OK? because they thought the water was fine. I mean, like, why wouldn't the water be fine? They were told the water was fine. For most of Jasmine's life, during the period of most critical brain development, she's been drinking Flint water. Is she going to be OK? We'll come back to Jasmine. Unless you've been in an underground bunker, you've heard of the Flint water crisis, right? You guys have heard about the Flint water crisis? And do you remember seeing pictures like this? And it's probably easier to explain this off as maybe somebody photoshopped this, or maybe somebody poured iced tea through that faucet. But this was real. The story of Flint is the story of the most emblematic environmental and public health disaster of this young century. It's a story of what happens when the very people responsible for keeping us safe and healthy care more about money and power than they do about us or our children. But the story of Flint is not isolated, and that is one of the reasons that I wrote this book. It is about the deeper crises facing our nation right now. The disintegration of critical infrastructure due to inequality and austerity. Environmental injustice that disproportionately affects the poor and the black, a disrespect for science and facts, a breakdown of democracy, an assault on our children. And the worst of all is our abandonment of our civic responsibility and our deep obligation as human beings to care and provide for each other. Despite all this badness, This story is also an incredible story, actually a playbook of resistance and hope. And that is a story that we all need right now, especially for our young people. So besides being an action-packed, first-hand account of what happened in Flint, what the eyes don't see is about people and places and problems that we choose not to see. In Flint, and beyond. But it is a rallying cry to remind us that it is our responsibility to open our eyes and each other's eyes to these problems. But being awake is not enough. We must take action for what is right, even when it's hard, even when it's scary, even when it may seem impossible. 
And this book reminds us that it is our duty. And it is an explicit reminder that individuals working together can make a difference. And just like my team was this unexpected ragtag collection of folks that came together from many different disciplines, this book also intersects many themes. Science, medicine, health, environment, education, policy, justice, democracy, immigration, diversity, and so much more. Because life is not neatly siloed into subject areas and university departments. And the solutions to our world problems require broad interdisciplinary perspectives. And it can't be lost that the story happened in Flint. So Flint, from its beginnings, has been a place of extremes, where greed met solidarity, where bigotry met fairness, where the struggle for equality has played out. So before the water crisis, what was Flint famous for? Cars, you guys are awesome, cars. So Flint was the birthplace of General Motors. Flint was the birthplace of cars. But even more importantly than the birthplace of cars, what else was Flint famous for? And you get, this is hard, you get extra credit if you know this. Oh my God, you're awesome, the sit down strikes. Flint was the birthplace of the middle class. In the 19, you totally get extra credit, we're gonna talk afterwards. So, <laughs> in the 1930s, workers sat down and occupied a series of car plants in Flint. And for 44 days in the cold Michigan winter, think like polar vortex cold, they sat and they demanded better wages and they demanded better working conditions. And even our Flint kids got involved. And management tried to starve them out and freeze them out and beat them up. And it took the personal intervention of the governor of Michigan, his name was Frank Murphy, by far my favorite governor. He went on to become a Supreme Court justice and he was the dissenting opinion in the Korematsu case. Who knows what that is? It's about Japanese internment, a different kind of ban at a different kind of time. So Governor Murphy and President Roosevelt intervened and the workers won. Their union, the UAW, was recognized. And for the first time, working people had access to prosperity, to a middle-class life, living wages, healthcare, housing, great schools, infrastructure, benefits, and even a pension. And this was called the grand bargain, and it was a great deal. And these fought for wages, informed wages across the country for decades. Flint was a promised land in the Great Migration North and for immigrants all over the world. And it wasn't even that long ago, the 1970s, and this is so hard to believe, that the people of Flint had the highest per capita income in the country. Can you believe that? People in Flint made the most money in the country. And because of that, they had some of the best public health indices. But what followed in Flint, like in many post-industrial cities, was decades of inequality and injustice, driven by greed and racism and neglect. Plants closed, jobs were lost, and poverty and violence became epidemic. And in this book, I don't shy away from giving readers a taste of history. And Flint history, public health history, lead history, even my own history, and it's not like fall asleep history, it's like exciting page-turning history. Um, Oprah Magazine put this book on their, her summer reading list and she said it had the gripping intrigue of a Grisham thriller. So it's like that like exciting history. <laughs> gripping, gripping, gripping history. Because these intercessions into history are so important because far too often we fail to see beneath the veneer of places. We filter out anything too complicated or too dark to process. Yet we walk over complex systems every day. We walk over history, yet pretending that darkness isn't there. And I was raised to, to dig deep, even if what I find is dark. 
I was raised to truly understand the world that I live in and how it came to be. And these are the same lessons that I impart on my students. So Flint, because of a history of bad policy choices, was thrust into near bankruptcy. And in 2011, our former governor, governor took over democracy. He appointed an emergency manager. And our former governor was a multimillionaire CEO whose mantra was that government should be run like a business. And at one point in Michigan, half of our African American population was under emergency management compared to 2% of our white population. Grossly undemocratic and grossly unjust. And the emergency manager's job was austerity. It was to save money, no matter what the cost. And they decided that the water that we had been getting for half a century from the Great Lakes was too expensive for this predominantly poor and minority community. And to save money, we would start drawing water from the local Flint River. And in April of 2014, with a very simple press of a button, we started drawing water from the local Flint River. And it didn't seem right. It was brownish, yellowish, greenish. It smelled weird. It tasted even weirder. And it turned out it was missing an important ingredient called corrosion control, which made it about 20 times more corrosive than the water that we had been getting from the Great Lakes. And it was so corrosive that General Motors, which was born in Flint and still has plants in Flint, noticed that it was corroding their engine parts. And they were allowed to go back to Great Lakes water. But the heroic and brave people of Flint, who knew something was wrong with their water, were told to relax, that everything was OK, that everything was in compliance. Well, it wasn't OK. It turns out that the water was so corrosive that it was leaching lead from our plumbing. And to be honest, as a pediatrician, I didn't even know that there could be lead in water before all this, despite caring for hundreds of children with lead poisoning. And I didn't even know what the word lead meant. So smart college people, what's the elemental symbol for lead? PB comes from the Latin plumbum, which means plumbing. So lead actually means plumbing. And in ancient times, the Romans built their aqueducts out of lead plumbing. And there's actually strong theories that hypothesize the demise of the Romans is because they used so much lead. They also put it in their food, which is not a good idea. Um, <laughs> makes you kind of wonder about Caesar's palace, but I think, uh, I, think, I think we're OK here. So the folks at the EPA said it was like we were drinking from lead-painted straws. And we never knew when a piece of lead scale from those curda pipes was going to come off those pipes into the drinking water and into the bodies of our children. And during this time, I, this was the summer of 2015, I was a practicing pediatrician, still am, was just in clinic a couple days ago, lots of flu and strep right now. <laughs> I was a medical educator, teaching my medical students and my pediatric residents, mom, wife, busy in my own busy bubble, like many of us are. And patients would come in and they would ask me, is it OK for me to mix my baby's powdered formula with this water? Is it OK to bathe my baby in this water? Are you sure we should be drinking eight glasses of water instead of pop or juice? Of course it's OK. How can our water not be OK? It's America, the richest country in the history of the world. It's the 21st century. This is not like 19th century London with rage and cholera epidemics. We've come a long way in water treatment. But it's also Michigan. Any Michiganders out there? Woohoo! Show me your hands. So if you're not from Michigan, check out. So we, well, where are you from? So we're the Mitten State. So Detroit, Flint, Lansing, and Arbor. So we're the Mitten State, right? What are we surrounded by? Water. We are surrounded by the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water in the world. 20% of the fresh water in the world is around the Great Lakes. 
But despite all of that, despite being America, the 21st century, being surrounded by water, there's rules, right? There's rules and there's regulations and there's people who wake up every day to make sure that when I turn on my tap, when you turn on your tap, our water is safe. That all changed for me when I heard about the possibility of lead being in the water. When a pediatrician hears the word lead, we freak out. It's probably the most well-studied poisons known to man. It's irreversible, it's potent, it erodes cognition, drops IQ levels, twists behavior. Levels we thought were okay decades ago when industry put lead in paint and gasoline, we now know are no longer okay. We respect the science that has gotten us to the point of recognizing that there is no safe level of lead exposure. And we also know that lead is a form of environmental injustice, environmental racism. The burden of lead does not fall equally on our nation's children. Kids in Flint already had higher lead levels, just like kids in Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Children suffering from so many of life's toxicities. But there's another side to the story and another side to Flint, and really the reason why I felt obligated to write this book. It is a story of how we came together and fought back. When I heard about the possibility of lead in the water, I, I freaked out, but I also could only go forward. I thought about Jasmine and the thousands of other kids just like her. As a pediatrician, I have literally taken an oath to protect children. My job very much is to make sure that kid in front of me is, is healthy, but more importantly, my job is to make sure that our children have the healthiest and brightest future. Just like educators, my work is nestled in promise and potential. And what was happening in our water was threatening the tomorrows of all of our children. And implicit in this story is that doctor or not, we have all taken an oath. We have all taken an oath to stand up and fight for our kids. So then I did something that doctors and academics aren't really supposed to do. Um, quickly conducted the research, found children's lead levels were elevated. And when you guys do research in academia, what do you, what do, you do next? Publish. Publish, how long does that take? <laughs> long time. Takes forever, uh, but you're supposed to go through that peer review process. But I literally walked out of my clinic and I stood up at a press conference and shared the research that our children were being poisoned by this water. It was a form of academic disobedience. <laughs> my favorite award I've ever gotten was a disobedience award from MIT. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, but very difficult to explain to my children that I got a disobedience <laughs> award. <laughs> Um, and right away, just like everyone else in the story who had spoken up about the water, the moms, the pastors, the activists, the journalists, I was attacked. I was dismissed. I was discredited. The state said I was wrong, unfortunate, and hysterical, which was also sexist. And for a minute, I believed them. I was scared. I was sick. I had a knot in my stomach that wouldn't go away. I had just gotten a Fitbit. I knew what my heart rate was. It was, close, it was close to 200. I thought to myself, what have I done? Maybe I should have just kept my mouth shut. Maybe I should have just minded my own business. I felt defeated and small, so unbelievably small. And then I quickly, quickly realized that this had nothing to do with me but everything to do with my kids. This was about Tyler, who had sprained his ankle. And this was about Sasha, who loves to use my stethoscope to listen to her heart. And this was about Jalen, who had pink eye. And this was about Jasmine, who wanted to be five when she grew up. And my research, my statistics, my numbers weren't just numbers. They were children children that I'd probably even seen and taken care of in that last year. 
faces, I knew their faces, I patted their heads, I'd held their hands, I'd hugged them tight. And it was those kids who were lifting me up, pushing me forward, and giving me courage. And it was for them that we fought back and kept going. And it took a while, but our, it was finally our persistence and our t teamwork and our science that spoke truth to power and exposed this man-made crisis. And within a few weeks, we were back on Great Lakes treated water. And to this day in Flint, we are still on filtered water and bottled water as our damaged lead pipes are being replaced because that takes time. But we have built a model public health program because we owe it to our children. And sometimes I say that I am writing prescriptions for hope. And our hope is not just words. It's real interventions that we have been able to put in place. Things like home visiting programs, early child care, brand new, two brand new child care centers, Head Start, preschool, home visiting programs, literacy programs, breastfeeding support, mindfulness programming, school health services, Medicaid expansion, trauma-informed care, and the list goes on and on. And we're also working on the bigger things, the more upstream things that all kids and families need. Things like living wage jobs, and poverty mitigation, and economic development, and participatory democracy, and restorative justice, and environmental justice, and self-determination. And a lot of our recovery in Flint is being supported by our Flint Kids Fund. We call this our Tomorrow's, Tomorrow Fund. And that's another reason I wrote this book. Part of the proceeds go back to this fund so that we can do this long-term work. And I'm also grateful to Penguin Random House because we've massively expanded our early literacy efforts. They donated 5,000 books, children's books, not my book, children's books, <laughs> to our Flint Kids Reads efforts. In places like Flint, there's only one book for every 300 children. By the time our children have reached the age of three, they've heard 30 million less words. We are changing all of those numbers. So I love to borrow this line from Frederick, Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, over 150 years ago. He said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And in a city known for building really strong cars, we are now building really, really strong kids. And to go back to Jasmine, when Jasmine's mom or any other parent asks me, is she going to be OK? I can now confidently respond that we are doing everything we know how to tip the scales. And the neat thing is that in a very data-driven academic way, we have begun to export our hope, our positive and proactive work, our best practices with communities everywhere. Because like I said, the story is not isolated. There are kids everywhere, black, brown, white, rural, urban, that are waking up to the same nightmares of poverty, injustice, lost democracy, austerity. The same situations that make zip codes more powerful than genetic codes. And this gets to my favorite part of the story, how we can once again learn from Flint. Yes, the story of Flint is a story of a crime committed with absolute indifference against some of the most vulnerable people in this country. But it is a story of how everyday people, moms, activists, pastors, journalists, students, scientists, doctors, said we've had enough and took action. The story is about how we all have the power to open our eyes and fix things. No matter who we are, or what we do, or where we are, or how long we've been in this country. Whether our families have been here for centuries, or we came here, like my family, an immigrant, escaping tyranny and dictatorship. I came to this country when I was four. I'll show you my birth certificate if you want. <laughs> and we came here for what most families come here for freedom, opportunity, democracy. 
And for me and my family, that American dream was absolutely realized. And I wake up every single day lucky to be in this country, but also acutely aware of what injustice can be and what people in power can do to vulnerable populations. As such, I grew up confident and competent and committed to serve my community, no matter where my community may be. And that immigrant story is, is proudly and unapologetically weaved into this book. Because that is who I am and that is how I see the world. But it is a timely story today because there are little kids that look just like me, same skin tone, who are trying to come to this country for the same reasons. But Lady Liberty's arms are not open as wide. It's as if the American dream has corroded. And those values that I learned of service and engagement that were ingrained in my head when I was a kid were solidified when I went to college by the classes I took, by the books I read, by teachers and mentors who told me that I had a role to play in making this world a better place. Martin Luther King said, no matter what ship brought you here, it definitely came on a different ship, <laughs> we're all in the same boat. And we definitely need the ships of students in this movement. Only then will we see a world that we have yet to see, a world of equality and opportunity. So that when I asked Jasmine, what do you want to be when you grow up? She can dream beyond the next year. And she really can be that doctor, that writer, that lawyer, the president, hopefully a student at one of your colleges, a trajectory that is not bound by zip code, by state of birth, by color of skin, by drinking water source, by school district, by country of origin. Let us work towards that America. You guys with me? Yeah. That America where people open their eyes, stand up for what's right, care for one another, and where democracy and equality and opportunity are once again encouraged and advanced. That is my story. That is also your story, a story of crisis, resistance, and hope. Thank you. <laughs>